Without further ado, we'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, uh, William Smith, who will be presenting on speed dating for Mac admins. All righty, thank you, everyone. Good to be here. Hi, everyone. I'm William Smith, a partner program manager with Jamf, and today we're going to be talking about the past, the present, and the future. I hope you'll indulge me on spending a little bit of time on history before I get into things. I love anything that has to do with times, dates, and calendars. Marking time is a personal fascination for me because it has so many uses. And what I think is most fascinating is that humankind recognized the power of marking time for millennia. One of the first tools for marking time was the water clock. They had several functions, but I really liked the way they were used by the Greek courts. Lawyers were allotted a finite amount of time to speak and that time was measured by water flowing from one vessel through a hole to another vessel. When the water emptied, the speaker's time was up. It was the perfect illustration of time running out. All they had to do to reset the clock was pour the water back into the first vessel. And what was really brilliant was they could pause the clock just by putting a finger over the hole. And in some cultures, even more important than tracking time was tracking dates or seasons or cycles. People needed to know when to worship. When is Easter this year? They needed to know lunar cycles. When does the month of Ramadan begin? When should we plant our crops to get the most yield but avoid frost or monsoons? When will the world end? I'm planning a party. In later centuries, it was the marine chronometer, a highly accurate timepiece invented in the early 1700s that allowed ship's navigators to determine their longitude when they could no longer see land. Latitude, your position on Earth from north to south, was determined by using an astrolabe in the 13th century or a sextant in later centuries to measure the stars compared to the horizon. That's easy to see when the planet is turning from west to east. But longitude had to be determined with time, specifically how far away you were from Greenwich Mean Time. Every hour away from GMT is 15 degrees, all sailors had to do was wait for the sun to reach its zenith in the sky, the highest point, and that would be noon local time. From there, they'd see what time it was back in Greenwich using their trusty chronometer. One hour's difference was 15 degrees longitude away. Two hours, 30 degrees, three hours, 45 degrees, and so on. Keep on going, and you end up with 24 of these time zones. But wait, how did sailors know their clock was telling the correct time? How does everyone sync their chronometers to the same time, even? Well, first you need an authority. Something like the Royal Observatory or any other local authority established around the world to actually monitor the Earth's rotation and determine when it's high noon. But then, how did the Royal Observatory go around synchronizing clocks in the 1700s? They borrowed another invention of the Greeks, which was the time ball. Ships had to be in port, or near a port, just before noon. They'd look up to a tall building on the highest hill where they could see a huge ball, usually at the top of a tall spire. Every day, at precisely noon, they'd drop the ball, signaling the exact time. Navigators from miles away in various bays and ports could set the chronometers at precisely that moment. We still have ball drops today, but they're mostly ceremonial and used to mark special occasions like Midnight, New Year's Eve in New York City, or other places around the world. Later, with the invention of the telegraph, which I like to call the original internet, and the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, we no longer had to be within line of sight of a time ball. As communities were connected by wires, all sorts of information could be transmitted, including the current time, from a central authority. Railroads depended on accurate times because they had to get trains from one station to another in an exact amount of time. On time. Every time. Time is money. To illustrate that point in modern times, today's high-frequency trading stock market servers handle transactions in milliseconds, and they rely on time syncing as accurate as one millisecond. Accuracy of this caliber has only been available to us within the past decade. Only computers can provide the speed of calculations we need today for our society to function the way it does. We don't even think about it. 
We all carry around computers in our pockets that also act as receivers and listen for GPS signals from multiple satellites in the sky. GPS relies on time. The signals we receive from satellites have nothing to do with distance, but rather what time it is right now. Satellites are time synced and our phones are time synced. The satellites are constantly broadcasting their current time and their current position. Each broadcast lasts about a millisecond. Our phones have the computational power to calculate the latency of the signal on the timestamp of the messages it receives and then calculate the distance to the satellite. Then using geometry and trigonometry to do something called triangulation, it can tell you where in the world you are. And because our computers are fancy, powerful calculators, we can accurately determine where in the Earth's orbit we currently sit. Then we can calculate where in Earth's orbit we need to be to launch a rocket to get us to Mars with the least amount of fuel. That's the end of my history lesson. I hope you found it interesting. It's computers that add a special magic to calculating times and dates. Basically, their speed. But we still need tools that can handle the calculations. What I'm going to show you today, in a short amount of time, are some of the tools and some interesting things you can do with time. Let's get started. I'm going to demonstrate everything in Terminal, so let's start by opening that. When you open Terminal, the first thing that happens is you're automatically logged in. As you can tell, I've customized my login. I've used a combination of an open source project for ZShell called Oh My ZShell, with the theme called Agnoster, and a font called Powerline. And my customization contains some date and time information. At the very top, Terminal lets me know the last time I logged in. We don't normally access our accounts from multiple terminal screens these days like administrators used to do when they were accessing a mainframe, but this was a nice little security feature where you could make sure you were the last one to log in and not someone posing as you. Or maybe you left a job running on another terminal and forgot to log out. If you don't want to see this message, you can run a touch command to create a hidden hush login file in your home directory. You won't see it again. And if you want it back, just delete the file using the remove command. The rest of the customizations are coming from a shell script I've added to a hidden Z login file in my home directory. You may have guessed it runs every time I open terminal and log in. As part of my login script, I've added the uptime for my computer. Two days isn't bad, but if I see something like 39 days, that might explain why my computer is running a bit sluggish, and maybe I need to restart. I'll talk more about this later. I've used the date command to tell me today's date, and right below it, I have something I called on this day. It's just something interesting. This is using the calendar command to read a local file of notable dates in computer history. The file exists on your Mac right now. I'll be talking more about the date and calendar commands in a few minutes. I want to start with two of my favorite terminal commands, cal and incal. They let you view formatted calendars in terminal. Just type in cal by itself and you get this month's calendar. That's pretty neat, and it even highlights today's date. I can enter Cal September 2022 to get the calendar for September of this year, or even Cal April 2030 to see several years into the future. And by the way, I can either spell out the name of the month or use its three-letter abbreviation. And if I leave out the month, I get the entire calendar for 2030. When I need to see a calendar, I don't look at a wall calendar or my Microsoft Outlook. I use Spotlight to open Terminal and type in a simple command. See what day of the week your birthday falls on next year. Or do you know the day of the week you were actually born? Just type Cal along with your birth month and year. Now, Cal has an interesting counterpart called NCAL, which is very similar to Cal. In fact, it's just a duplicate of the Cal binary with an N at the beginning of its name. But a funny thing happens when you rename Cal to NCAL. It displays formatted calendars vertically instead of horizontally. It's literally written to behave two different ways depending on whether its name is Cal or its name is NCAL. I tested this. I copied the Cal binary to the, from the USR bin directory to my desktop, 
ran it in the terminal, and I got a normal calendar. Then I named it to NCAL, ran it again, and got back a vertical calendar. Funny thing is, I can still run Cal with a dash N option to invoke NCAL. So you decide. Is this attention to detail, or is it just wacky programming? I don't know. NCAL might be useful if you're using it as part of a script and want to use a grep command to get the dates of all the Fridays in a single month, or any other day of the week. That gets a little messy, though, if we're looking at an entire year. I just hit up arrow to repeat the same command and put in 2022. It's a little difficult to determine which row of dates belongs to which month. Now, so far, I haven't necessarily needed the dash E as part of the grep command just to find the Fridays, but in addition to looking for Fridays, we can also look for lines that start with blank characters to return the years and the names of the months. That should make reading this list of Fridays easier, and now I do need that dash E. I'll hit the up arrow to bring back my command. Here, I'm piping the result of ncal into the grep command, using a regular expression to return all the lines that begin with either a blank character or Friday, or I could use awk to do something similar. One thing we can do with ncal that we can't do with cal, unless we're running it in ncal mode with the dash n option, is display week numbers. All we have to do is add the dash w option, and you'll see them running along the bottom. We can add 2022 to see the entire year. And again, I can use those same grep commands to get the dates of all the Fridays of a single month or a year with their week numbers. The last command here is probably the most useful. I see the year, I see each month, I see the dates of each Friday in the month, and the week number of each one. An interesting use I found for this is to see my upcoming paydays. We're paid every other week, and every other week for us is an odd-numbered week. Now what I can do is look forward to see which months have three odd week numbers, and that tells me I have an extra paycheck that month. That's Cal and NCAL, really simple to use. Our computers can calculate and format these calendars in milliseconds, whereas in the medieval era, the royal astrologer or a monk in the Catholic Church would have had to do all this manual calculation with lots of reference tables. And as you can probably guess, it was pretty prone to error. Next, I'm going to clear my terminal window and log in again to go back to my customized terminal login screen. Let's talk about this, my on this day message. I said earlier, it's using a calendar command and it's something you have on your Macs right now. There's some interesting history behind this calendar command. Lord of the Rings Diehards existed well before Peter Jackson movies were released in the 2001 through 2003 years. I read the trilogy myself when I was in middle school. Computer geeks and fantasy go hand in hand. Now, 10 years ago, back in November of 2012, a Mac user discovered a Lord of the Rings calendar on his computer. It was buried in some of the hidden directories. And if you read the file, you'd find important dates from the Lord of the Rings. Now, back then, every Mac blog reported it, but they didn't go into much detail about it. Where did it come from? Why is it there? Let's talk history again and get a timeline of events. I'll start us out with what we already know, when the movies were released and when the calendar was discovered. The calendar command first appeared in Unix 7th edition in 1979. It was listed then, and still is today, as a reminder service. It included a few sample calendars, and one was called Calendar.History, a calendar of world events. Over time, the history calendar was appended to and updated, until someone in 1994, in the 4.4 BSD version of Unix, a descendant of version 7 Unix, decided to add Lord of the Rings references. I guess you could call that a kind of history, right? In February 2003, someone decided it was its own history and split off Lord of the Rings into its own calendar and left history for real events. I love the short note about this split. Add the Space Shuttle Columbia incident to the history calendar. 
While here, move the Lord of the Rings history events into their own calendar file. Link it to the world calendar to preserve visibility of this pre-trendy gem in BSD. And this generated what I think is one of my favorite bug reports. Eight months later, in October 2003, someone filed bug 57623, one LOTR calendar event still in calendar.history. An event was left behind. Frodo crosses the bridge to Methethel. A few days later, that bug was fixed. But it wasn't until Mac OS X Leopard that it finally made it onto your machines, where it lay undiscovered for the next five years. Worth noting, that calendar.history file from 1994 was present in Mac OS X before Leopard. It was there as part of Mac OS X Kodiak, the public beta, a dozen years before it was rediscovered. Bilbo, Frodo, Gandalf, and the gang have been there the entire life on Mac OS X. Now you know the rest of the story. Calendar files are there to support the calendar command. They not only provide you a handy list of dates, but they're examples of what you can do. First, let's see what else we can find in addition to the Lord of the Rings. I'm going to list the contents of the USR Share Calendar directory. We see over 30 calendars, some of which are in various languages. These are just plain text files. We can use cat to read any of them. You can tell many of these had to be somebody's labor of love. Here, I'm showing the contents of the music calendar. My on this day line from my login screen is pulling from the computer calendar. You're going to see a lot of older computer history and not much new, but it does have a couple of Apple dates, which is nice. I'm using the cat command to read the entries file, but it was really meant to be read by the calendar command itself. Remember, it's a reminder service. Before we had GUI interfaces like macOS, Windows, GNOME, or KDE, there was only a full screen terminal you were expected to create your own calendar file of birthdays, anniversaries, and events. Maybe you'd read it as part of your login script like I'm doing. Or maybe you'd have it mail you about upcoming events. It's pretty easy to use. At its most basic, it expects a file named calendar in whatever your current directory is. That's usually your home folder. Let's look at a simple one that I put together. Now, starting at the top, Anything between the slash star and the star slash is just a comment. Each event is typically the month and day followed by a tab, then a description. It's helpful to include years if you're marking a specific day in history, like I've done with the birthdays and anniversary section. On lines 6 through 8, I've used three different formats for describing a date. These are all valid. The asterisk means any month. I need to pay our mortgage on the third of every month. If I put just the day of the week, then I get a reminder on that day every week. Fridays are family game night. And the third event is the Memorial Day holiday here in the U.S. It's never on the same date, but it's always the last Monday of May. Now, look at what I've done for backup, starting on line 19. I'm following a common backup strategy, which is to do a full backup the first Friday of every month, and then incremental backups Monday through Friday the rest of the month. The first four reminders on lines 21 through 24 alert me which sets of backup tapes I need to use every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. For Friday, I've created Friday plus 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Those numbers indicate the first Friday of the month, the second, the third, and so on. Finally, remember those other calendars we saw in the USR Share Calendar directory? If I wanted to see events from those, I can use an include command as you see here. If I wanted, I could create a separate calendar for birthdays and anniversaries and another one for backups and include those here instead of putting them all in here. If I run the calendar command, I see several things. I see it's not only showing me today's events, but also tomorrow's. It's giving me a heads up. It's telling me Georges Bizet died on this date in 1875. That's from the music calendar. Nothing's happened in the world of token this day. But Friday is going to be a busy day. 
It's the first Friday of the month, so I need to take a full backup. It's also Lori's birthday. We'll get together with her at family game night. And I need to pay my mortgage. Where you see asterisks here, that means the date changes from week to week or month to month. It's not the same every time. Of course, today we have sexy GUI tools like Apple Reminders and Microsoft Outlook, but if you're in Terminal, a lot like me, and you feel like being a little bit geeky, it can be nice to be reminded every once in a while what's happening in Middle Earth. Or maybe somebody will put together a calendar.apple file. Let's talk about time next, a super useful command line utility if you haven't discovered it yet. Have you ever run the system profiler command? It's the equivalent of the system report that you can get by selecting About This Mac from the Apple menu. It gathers all sorts of information from installed software, the operating system, hardware specs down to each component, and even information about peripherals attached to your computer. If you run it without any argument, it takes a long time to finish. But just how long? That's where the time command comes in handy. Just add it to the beginning of any command and it'll time how long it takes. The time command itself doesn't add any significant overhead to the process you're timing. It's just starting a stopwatch at the beginning of your command and then clicking stop when it's done. It's far more accurate than you timing this on your watch. I sped this up to save a little bit of time, but the eventual output took about 38 seconds. I'm looking at the total on the last line at the very end. If you're a Jamf customer, you might be interested in seeing how long it takes to run an inventory report. Running Jamf Recon in Terminal requires elevated privileges, which means I need to use sudo. But the time command always comes first, so I'll run time sudo Jamf Recon. Again, I've sped this up to save a little bit of time and tedium, but in real life, we'll see it takes about 32 seconds. If we look at the man page for time, there's not much to it, but I see it has a dash P option, which will print each time on its own line. That might be useful for scripting where I want to make it easy to parse the results. Let's see what that looks like. Ah, now, wait a minute. This time I get an error. It's telling me it can't find the dash p command, but I just read about it in the man page, so what gives? There are two times. When I run time by itself without any options, I'm actually using a shell built-in command. I can see that by running which time. The man page I was looking at was for the time binary located in the USR bin directory. This is the one that has the dash p option I want. So, I'll run USR bin time dash p sudo jamf recon. This time I don't receive an error when adding the dash p option. Now I'll get the simple output with the real time on the first line. That's the one I want. I'm going to hit up arrow to bring back my time command for jamf. The easiest way I've found to parse this is to encapsulate the entire time command in parentheses. However, that's going to output the results of the jamf recon command. The time command's output goes to standard error, so I need to redirect that to standard output. Now, I can pipe that into an awk command that looks for any line that contains real and print the second item on the row, which is the time. Let's see how long it takes. Twenty-seven seconds in real time. It's the simple things that quite often make lives much easier. Time is about as simple as it gets. Or maybe not. How about uptime? Just type uptime into terminal to see how long your computer's been running without a restart. Or better yet, ever had an end user open a ticket and you tell them to restart, and then they report that it didn't work? Run uptime on their computer. Point to where it says 130 days. Make sure they didn't just turn their monitor off and on. Are you using a management tool to report on your computers, and would you like to collect the uptime for them? 
It's easy to use awk to parse the uptime just for the time. But be warned, uptime can return information in five different formats. This command's carefully crafted to account for all of them. If you see extra information about no such file or directory in your output, that means you probably have multiple terminal windows open. Don't worry about it, the command itself only returns the uptime. Other than that, uptime's so simple, even its man page shows it has no options. That's uptime. That's even simpler than a simple gets. Let's clear the screen again and quickly talk about the string formatter for time function. It's going to come in really handy when we get into the date command. It has a very simple purpose. It's a function. A function is nothing more than reusable code that serves a specific purpose. In this case, the string formatter for time takes an epoch time and reformats it to a string in the format you ask for. If you don't give it an epoch time, it just assumes right now. So first, what is an epoch time? Very simply, it's the number of seconds away from January 1st, 1970, at midnight. If I run the string formatter without providing a date, I get today's date and time. I'll explain the substitution characters in a minute, but for now, just know that this returns year, month, day, hour, minute, and seconds. That's just a few seconds ago. If I provide it an epoch time like this, it translates into the year, month, day format that I'm specifying. This number is and always will be Halloween 2014. That's an exact number of seconds away from January 1st, 1970. I should be able to prove that by prove that just by setting the number to zero. Uh, but wait, uh, that's December 31st, 1969 at 6 p.m. What's wrong with my computer? The answer is nothing is wrong. I just happen to be in St. Paul, Minnesota, which is Central Time, and has an offset of six hours from Greenwich Mean Time, or UTC. Just like our sailing ships synchronize their chronometers with GMT to calculate their longitude, Epoch Time is also standardized to GMT. To compensate for my time zone, I'd have to adjust the epoch time by 21,600 seconds. That's six hours. So that's interesting. Why am I showing you all of this? It's really for the string formatter's man page. At first, it doesn't look all that exciting, but if you start to scroll down, you'll quickly get to its list of conversion characters. I was using these earlier. Each conversion character begins with a percent sign, followed by one upper or lowercase letter. The letter you use decides the format of the time or the date that you'll get back. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of websites that post this information as if it were a Rosetta Stone or a cheat sheet for formatting date and time strings. Save yourself the trouble. You have it on your computer. Just look at the man page. Let's get acquainted with a few of these conversion characters. We'll start with A. A is for day of the week. Capital A is for the full spelling. Lowercase a is for the abbreviation. B is for month. Capital B is for the full spelling. Lowercase b is for the abbreviation. Why didn't we use M for month? Well, because capital M is for minutes. But, if you want, you can use lowercase m. That stands for the two-digit numerical month. Follow the man page. Don't bother to memorize these. If you use any of them frequently enough, they'll stay with you. Now, let's reset everything again and move on to one last command. Date. Of all the commands, I've created more snippets and cheat sheets for date than any other. If you're dealing with calendars or times or timers or log files, you're going to be using date. I'm going to quickly show you a little bit about date, ways to display various dates and times, and a few things you can do. So first, running date by itself in terminal returns the date and time right now. It's very computery looking. 
What I mean by that is it's a long string of information where some things like the weekday and the month are abbreviated, whereas the time string of this is down not only to the second, but to the time zone. And the year is thrown on at the end, when it really should be after the date. It's a mishmash of data without much thought put into what's getting displayed. Now, date can do a few things. It can set the date and time on your computer. It can display dates and times in various formats, and it can do some pretty cool date calculations. Today, practically every computer is time synced. And other than testing, there's really little reason for you to manually adjust your clock. But you can do it with date. This will set the date on my computer to July 1st. 07 for month, 01 for date, 00 for hour, 00 for minute, and 22 for year. It immediately displays the new time. Or if you just want to set the time and leave the date alone, just put in the two-digit hour and two-digit minute. Oh, hey, look, it's five o'clock. Time to go home. My computer said so. When you're done with testing, I suggest running the system setup command to turn time sync off and on. That'll resync your clock immediately and get you back to what you should be using. I'm running it manually here and getting some garbage, but it works just fine. If you forget, your Mac should automatically sync within about the next 20 minutes anyway. So let's play a little with Epoch Time, also known as Unix Epoch. To display the Epoch Time for right now, we'll use one of those conversion characters. The plus symbol is there to tell date. I want you to output the date in the format represented by the percent %s. And by the way, the reason I showed you the string formatter a bit ago is that date is using the same conversion characters. Now the string formatter's epoch time is just slightly higher than the date command I just ran before it because there was a smidge of time that elapsed between those two commands. So what can I do with two numbers? I can use math. I can take the higher number and subtract the lower number to get the difference in seconds. I've used that as a timer for some of my scripts that could take a while to run. In this example, I assigned the epoch time to a variable at the top, run my script, and then get the epoch time again at the bottom. I calculate the difference and report the running time. This is a great little snippet for a lot of scripts. Let's talk a little bit about formatting. This is one of my pet peeves, so pay attention. Here's something an admin might write and display to an end user. Again, this is a very computery message. I've seen folks get the default date and use it when what they're really trying to do is just mark the time. Or maybe they're trying to mark the date and they're including the time because they don't know how to parse its output. It's extremely easy to do. Let's see how. First, we don't need the echo command. Date acts like echo. So we'll start our command with date. Next, we need to phrase what we want to say. Started update at hour, colon, minute, space, AM, PM. This will take about 30 minutes. That's the format I really want. And remember, we need to include that plus symbol at the beginning to signify I want some output in the format I'm giving. Notice I've written this out as I'd like it to read and made placeholders for hours, minutes, and AM, PM. I don't need the year. I don't need the time zone. I don't even need to know what day or what month it is. This only takes 30 minutes. Now, I'll look at the conversion character for hour. I see it's percent capital H. So I'll replace hour in my phrase with that. I'll do the same for minutes. That's percent capital M. And I don't know if this will be running in the morning, evening, or afternoon, which is why I like to include AM, PM. That's percent P. And notice I'm including the colon between the hour and minutes. It's not a special character. And I'm including the space before AM, PM. Now, let's see if this looks like what I want. Hmm, that's about right. But I see something that bothers me. 1327 PM. When displaying the time using a 24-hour clock, 
I don't need the AM PM. Here in the US, it's more common to display a 12 hour clock and keep the AM PM. So I'll do that. Looking back at the man page for the time formatter, I see I can use percent capital I. Let's see what that looks like. That's closer, but I still don't like it. I have no need for that leading zero. I'm trying to display an end user friendly message that's easy to read. I'm going back to my man page and looking deeper. Now I think I see what I'm looking for. I'm going to replace that capital I with a lowercase l. I'm 99% there, but do you see what I see? The percent %L character is padding the hour with a blank space at the beginning. I don't want that. There's one more thing I need to do. I can put a minus symbol where there may be padding to tell it not to pad. If I look at it one last time, I have perfection. Don't think you're locked into a specific format for dates and times. Some of the conversion characters, like the percent capital A for full weekday and the percent lowercase a for abbreviated weekday, give you options for making your dates and times easy to read and understand. Use a pen and paper to write a sentence as you would read it. Then take the time to find the right conversion characters to format it correctly. Let's try to solve another problem with dates. Now, what do you do when something gives you a date that looks like this? Maybe it's from a log file, but what you need is something that looks like this. You have to do three things. First, you have to tell date what the format is you're giving it. Then you have to provide the date, and then you have to tell it the format you want. I'm going to start off this command with date, and I'm going to add a couple of options. The dash J is just saying, don't try to set the clock, just take the rest of this as input. Now I'm going to add a dash F to tell date, here's the format of the date that I have. Then I'm going to replace the numbers with their conversion characters. And notice I'm including the dashes. That's the part of the format. Date doesn't care about the dashes, but if they're in the date string you're providing, you need to include them in your format. The same would go for any other characters. Then I follow that with the actual date string I have. Date will take that and say, I understand the format of the string you're giving me. I can tell there's a year, a month, and a day in that order and separated by dashes. Now you tell date what format you'd like it to give you. Similar to what we've done earlier, we'll start the following string with a plus symbol to say, this is the format I want you to output. And just like we did earlier, we start using conversion characters to give it the format we want. As we saw earlier, percent %A means the weekday spelled out. I'll follow that with a comma and a space, then type percent %B, which means the month spelled out. I'll follow that with a comma and a space, and then percent %Y means the full four-digit year. When I press return, I see the same date, but in the format I want now. And if I make a mistake, like I did here, and I type a 4 instead of a 2, I can press up arrow to bring back my command and make a quick edit to my input date, and now I really get what I'm after. All right, one last thing to show you. What if the date is a moving target? Recently, in the U.S., we celebrated Memorial Day. It never falls on the same date. It always falls on the last Monday of May. Or think about leap years and leap day. It always falls on February 29th, but in years like 2022, February 29th is an invalid date. It doesn't exist because this wasn't a leap year. The date command is smart enough to help us figure out these moving targets. It has an option called adjust, and it's always prefaced by dash V. Adjust can do three different things. It can set a date or time property, like setting the day to Monday or setting the hour to 4 p.m. It can adjust a date or time property backwards, like previous Monday or from 4 p.m. to 3 p.m. And it can adjust a date or time property forwards, like the next Monday or from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. 
let's see what it takes to determine if next year is a leap year without looking it up. We'll start with just the date command. Again, it returns right now. The first thing I'll do is adjust the year from 2022 to 2023. I do that with a dash V option followed by a plus one Y, or forward one year. I'd use two or three or four if I wanted to adjust more years forward. Notice how everything else stayed the same, but the year is now 2023. So to keep going, I just keep adding things until I land where I want. This takes some practice, but once you understand what you're doing, it's really, really super simple. Now what I want to do is adjust the month back to March. March 1st is the first day after the last day of February, whether it's a leap year or not. So remember, the dash V option can set a time property. I'll use it to set the month to 3 or March. I do that by hitting up arrow to bring back my last command, and then I just add to the end of it. Now it reads March 2nd. I'll use the dash V option this time to set the day to the 1st. We have March 1st, 2023. What's the date before that? Is it the 28th or the 29th, a leap year? I don't know, but the date command will tell me. So I hit up arrow again to bring back my command, and I add to the end of that dash V minus one day. It's February 28th, not a leap year. How about next year? Yes, it is. By the way, I could have also used the dash V option to simply set the year to 2023 or 2024. Either way it would get me there. Like many command line tools, they can be fun puzzles. I have to admit that date's one of my favorites, probably because I can do so much with it. Maybe someday I'll be as enthusiastic about Ock or said. That's all I have. I appreciate you coming to see me today. I've posted a list of resources and commands for you on GitHub. Don't forget, log off your terminal when you're done. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, William Smith, for that wonderful presentation. I'm going to go ahead and start our QA. Uh, the first question is a pretty fun question, so we'll uh, ask, can we see the rubber, doc, rubber duck to appease the demo gods? <laughs> <laughs> I recorded everything, so I didn't have any demos, but I've got it. It's right here in my trusty server closet. Ah, oh, the rubber duck. <laughs> Fantastic. I appreciate folks remembering that. I, uh, the next question is from Kelly, and she says that you brought this on yourself. Um, is it true that you're older than you've ever been, and now you're even older? That is very true, even as of right now. All right. I appreciate that folks are right. actually were reading some of those comments. It was fun looking up date and time weird things like that. So thanks for asking, Kelly. Our next question comes from Rebecca, who is asking uh, if the slides will be available anywhere after the presentation, and it was great information. Uh, number two, thank you. And I can make the slides available. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to uh, see the resources uh, link that I put up, it's uh, basically, I'll, I'll post it back in, in the uh, PSU Mac Slack uh, channel. Uh, the yeah and for mac admins i can make the slides available to you if you want them they're you know they're just a means of it to an end to get to the actual presentation but uh ping me in mac admin slack and i can give them to you excellent uh anonymous question and i think a lot of us are actually interested in this is how was your demo done with those terminal windows were those animated gifs not gifs but mp4s yes uh I went to great lengths to do weird little things, uh, pay attention to details, like uh, whenever I was recording everything, to, to use that date command that I was talking about to set my clock and to set the date forward so that it would look like it's today. 
Uh, the times don't match, I'm sure, uh, whatever times were today, but I did try to make it look like it was happening today. But they were just Excellent. they were just recordings. Excellent. One final point uh, from Stefan is ducks and chickens are not the same for what it's worth. William has a rubber chicken, not a duck. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So true. And it's it, to me, this is the classic. It makes no noise. Not like those ones that you see them squeezing out Bacabelli or anything like that online. Bacacelli? Bacabelli? I don't know how to say that person's name. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, well, if there isn't any more uh, Q&A, um, I wanna give a very special thanks to William Smith for taking the time to deliver us today's first session.